This is the third semi-annual progress report on the National Aeronautics and Space Administration's Project Centaur. Responsibility for overall direction of the project has been delegated to NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Deputy Director of the program is the Centaur Project Officer at the Air Force's Ballistic Missile Division in Los Angeles. He works with a contracting officer at the Air Force Ballistic Missile Center, Englewood, California, in providing contractual authority to the two associate contractors, Pratt & Whitney Aircraft, and Convair Astronautics. By the end of June 1960, the first Centaur flight vehicle was in final assembly. The first LR-115 engines for ground tests were being tested by Pratt & Whitney aircraft prior to delivery. Major electronic units, such as autopilot and guidance systems, were in production. And both the Pad 36 launch complex and the F-4 capture test stand were nearing completion. At Convair Astronautics in San Diego, California, the buildup of the first flight vehicle will be reviewed by Dean Davis, Centaur Project Engineer. Development of the Centaur Space Flight Vehicle is now entering the production phases. By the end of June, fabrication of the first flight vehicle was well underway. In January, we began producing the smaller items, the bracketry, clamps, pins, and the parts for electrical, pneumatic, and hydraulic assembly. Then we built the tank sump, ducting, and other associated plumbing hardware. Major assembly of the first flight vehicle designated C-1, started March 18th, on schedule. The vehicle was fabricated in the same high bay area used for manufacturing the Atlas ICBM. In fact, from 80% of the equipment used to build Centaur is Atlas production tooling. The Centaur C-1 tank began with this roll of light gauge 301 stainless steel. The steel used throughout the tank is thinner than a dime, ranging in thickness from 10 to 23 thousandths of an inch. This steel was inspected by its manufacturer and again when it was received at Convair Astronautics. At this table, it is rough cut into sections and samples are cut from every 35 feet of each roll and are tension tested to destruction. After inspection, the skin section is sized and trimmed and then is butt joined by an automatic heliarc welder. Every hour, work samples from all welding machines are subjected to x-ray and fatigue tests to ensure that all welds meet quality standards. The weld joints are further reinforced by strips of steel called doublers. A doubler is spot welded behind each beam. The machine operator follows a weld pattern established to provide the greatest possible strength to the joint. While the constant skin sections were being fabricated, buildup was also underway on the bulkheads for C1. The bulkheads begin in this radial stretch former, which forms the sections called gores. After trimming, the gores are placed in a butt weld fixture where they are welded together by a heliarc torch. Here, as the gores are positioned and then joined, the bulkhead begins to take shape. As always, the constant inspection continues. Each weld is painted with a penetrating die. A flaw would be indicated if the die penetrates the seam. One joint is still open as the new bulkhead is lowered into a checked gauge. The open joint allows for exact sizing and trimming, which is accomplished here. When trimming is completed, the bulkhead is returned to the butt weld fixture for welding of the final joint. Mating with the thrust cylinder is a final step in the buildup of the aft bulkhead. 
Before the bulkhead reached this operation, reinforcing doublers had been spot welded under all speeds. The aluminum cylinder, which is riveted to the bulkhead, serves as a firm support for engine attachment. On May 20th, Centaur's forward bulkhead was positioned in the major well fixture and final tank assembly was started. The vehicle is assembled from the nose back. Sections and bulkheads are progressively welded into place until fabrication is complete. Removable internal and external rings maintain the true circular shape of the skin sections during assembly. The sections are overlapped. Alignment of each section must be within one and a half thousandth of an inch. Seam and spot welds are made at each seam by an automatic resistance type welder. Electricity arching between the welding wheels melts the metal between, forming the weld. To prevent undesirable torque stresses during welding, the tank assembly is rotated by a powered head fixture attached to the nose. The vehicle is divided into two propellant tanks by the intermediate bulkhead, which consists of two shells with fiberglass insulation filling the space between. The bulkhead acts as a heat barrier between the minus 423 degree Fahrenheit liquid hydrogen in the forward tank and the minus 297 degree Fahrenheit liquid oxygen in the aft tank. With the attachment of the aft bulkhead, the main tank structure of the first centaur was completed. The capacity of the liquid hydrogen tank is approximately 9,390 gallons and the capacity of the oxidizer tank is 2,000 970 gallons. After assembly, the tank was moved outside the plant for testing. All support rings were removed and it was pressurized with helium to four pounds per square inch. In design concept, Centaur's tank can be likened to a football. Both derive their strength from tough skins maintained under constant stress by internal pressure. Centaur's jettisonable nose bearing, which forms a cone-like shield over the payload, is in production at the Convair Division in Fort Worth, Texas. It is designed to protect the payload from aerodynamic loads and heating, and to reduce drag on the overall vehicle. A completed unit consists of two half sections and a nose cap, and weighs approximately 750 pounds. It stands 18 feet high and measures 10 feet in diameter at the base. On the vehicle, the sections are joined by explosive latches. The latches open when they receive the jettison signal, and two small nitrogen gas thrust bottles force the fairings away from Centaur. The fairings are constructed of a fiberglass honeycomb, one and three quarters of an inch thick which is placed between thin layers of fiberglass cloth. The materials are bonded into a completed section during a five-hour curing process in an oven at temperatures up to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. During flight, the fairings will be subjected to loads up to 950 pounds per square foot and temperatures as high as 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit. But according to calculations, the payload will not be affected by load forces, nor will it be heated above normal operating temperatures. The first fairing, fabricated in March, was used exclusively for testing purposes. Samples were cut from it for bending, tension, and compression studies. The test confirmed the soundness of the fairing's design. Each sample surpassed design requirements before it failed. 
while buildup continued on the insulation and the flight vehicle, Centaur electronic systems were also in final development. Autopilot group engineer Howard Newman reports on the status of the autopilot and guidance program. Centaur Autopilot is responsible for stabilizing the vehicle in flight, steering it in response to signals from guidance, and sequencing such events as engine start and payload separation. By March, prototype autopilot systems were undergoing evaluation tests, and production of the first flight units began two months later. We use miniaturized components and solid-state circuitry to make all four units of the autopilot as compact, light, and reliable as possible. This high-power switch component is for the flight programmer, which contains the switches and controls necessary to sequence the vehicle's flight functions. On command from the guidance system, the programmer provides the switching sequences to start engines, separate the vehicle from the Atlas first stage, and to pressurize propellant tanks, among other functions. Centaur is stabilized in flight by the 16-pound rate gyro package being ready here for calibration tests. Three gyros in the unit sense the vehicle's turning rate in pitch, yaw, and roll, and compare this to guidance inputs, which tell what the turning rate should be. It then sends signals indicating the degree of error in the turning rate to the servo amplifier package. The servo amplifier, which in effect steers the vehicle, directs gimbling of the main engines to correct for turning errors. It also fires the small attitude rocket during coasting periods to position the Centaur's tail toward the sun and to reorient it for main engine restart. The logic circuitry, which determines which attitude rockets to fire, are being checked here. The blinking light represents the rocket. Three sun trackers mounted on the sides and rear of Centaur provide the command to position its tail to the sun during coast phase. Solar cells in the units register exposure to sunlight. The vehicle's attitude with respect to the sun is determined by signals from the cells being exposed. Prototype trackers were mounted on a test stand and bore sighted on the sun for calibration study. During flight, the vehicle senses that its tail is pointing toward the sun when only its rear solar cells register exposure. The tail to the sun attitude reduces fuel boil off by keeping as much sunlight as possible away from the propellant tank. The all inertial guidance system for Centaur is in production at the Minneapolis Honeywell Regulator Company's Inertial Guidance Center in St. Petersburg, Florida. Development work has progressed from the pre-production design stages of last December to completed systems by June. This is the first of nine flight systems now being produced at the rate of one a month. These components were finished in late April and then subjected to a series of tests to validate the design and fabrication of each individual unit. In the individual test, packages like the inertial platform are evaluated to ensure that they meet all electronic and mechanical specifications. Performance of the platform during early tests surpassed the design requirements. This four gimbal platform contains the accelerometer, which measure acceleration, and the gyros that space stabilize them. Performance and electrical continuity checks are conducted on all modules before they are assembled with completed units for further testing. Essentially, this platform electronic unit provides the electronics to stabilize the inner cluster of the inertial platform. Power for the guidance system is supplied by the power supply and pulse rebalance unit. As the name implies, it also generates a direct current pulse to rebalance the pendulums in the accelerometers. In this test, the unit's performance is checked before it is incorporated into a system. Design proofing tests, such as the resonance search the signal conditioner package is undergoing, determine the design integrity of each unit. This unit converts guidance system performance data to direct current signals, which are sent to the vehicle's telemetry system for transmission to the ground. 
The final checkout before delivery is the integrated system test series in which all units are connected and operated as a completed system. Ground service equipment developed specifically to check out and calibrate sensor guidance is tied into the system for evaluation at the same time. By the end of June, the ground service sets and one complete flight ready guidance system were undergoing final acceptance tests prior to delivery to Convair Astronautics. Throughout the CENTOR program, considerable emphasis has been focused on the testing of parts, components, and systems. Test highlights of the past six months will be reviewed by Fred Wallace, Group Engineer in the Systems Test Laboratory. To date, most CENTOR testing has been concentrated in our main plant laboratory and here at the Point Loma test site from 15 miles from my main facility. One test series confirmed the practicability of the explosive bolt system, which will jettison CENTOR's insulation panels. For test purposes, four aluminum panels were mounted on a stainless steel tank section. They weigh the same as Centaur insulation, although they are only 14 inches high as compared to 16 feet for the actual flight article. The panels are secured to the tank section by corrugated steel bands, as they will be on flight vehicles. Both ends of the bands are connected to finger-sized explosive bolts. The steel around the bolts is cupped in a way that diverts all fragments from the bolts away from the vehicle or in this case, the test unit. Before tension is applied to the straps, four jettison springs are placed under each panel. The springs force the panel away from the tank when the restraining bands are released. High-speed motion picture cameras positioned around the test unit recorded the jettison sequence for later analysis. Just prior to the test, powder charges are placed in the bolts. The shield protects the technicians from the restraining straps, which are now under 400 pounds tension. The explosive charges containing approximately the same amount of powder as a 22 caliber bullet are ignited electrically. They split the bolts, which in turn release the band. The cargo net was a safety measure, since it was not known during the first test how far the bands or panels would travel from the tank. On April 8th, the first of four jettison systems tests was conducted. The entire jettison sequence takes two and a half milliseconds from the time the bolts are fired. This and the subsequent test proved the soundness of the explosive bolt jettison system. In another test series, the behavior of liquid hydrogen was studied in a one-fifth scale aluminum model of the Centaur tank. The primary test objective was the evaluation of a sump designed to prevent vortexing in Centaur's liquid hydrogen tank. Vortexing is the tornado-like swirling of a liquid as it leaves the container. A vortex can draw air or gas vapors into the booster or turbo pump, causing the malfunction of both. A secondary objective of the test series was a study of the characteristics of hydrogen under varying pressures. Television and motion picture cameras permitted engineers to view the interior of the tank throughout the test. The hydrogen is boiling now since there is not enough pressure in the tank to keep it stable. The fuel will also boil in centaur, but not this violently. As pressure is introduced, the fuel settles and boiling diminishes. The slight boiling continuing on the left is caused by a warm spot on the dome-shaped intermediate bulkhead. No vortexing occurs as the tank empties. This test series confirmed the design worthiness of the sump. During the past six months, the Centaur cruiser tank, which is constructed of heavier steel than that used in flight vehicles, was again the center of Point Loma testing activity. This full-scale test article is used for testing vehicle and ground support systems, studies of propellant boil-off rates, and evaluation of loading techniques. In April, a hydrogen boost pump was installed for system integration tests. The pump is powered by a hydrogen peroxide-driven turbine. It's designed to deliver up to 1,270 gallons a minute of hydrogen in a liquid state to the engine turbo pump. On April 12th, the tank was filled with 8,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen for the first test of the pump. Prior to fuel loading, the tank had first been purged with gaseous nitrogen to remove potential oxidants. Then gaseous hydrogen had been used to purge the system of the nitrogen and to chill it to receive the liquid. Just 63 seconds after the pump was started, the test was aborted because of fire. The fire was caused by hydrogen, which leaked through the pump's discharge line seal. 
it was ignited by heat from the turbine exhaust. Except for minor charring, no damage was done to the pump or the cruiser tank. Ten days later, in a night tanking operation, the pump performed normally during an 11-minute run. By June 30th, the pump had operated 28 minutes during four separate tanking tests without malfunction. Astronautics is currently evaluating new seals to replace the type responsible for the leak which caused the fire. On May 5th, the first cruiser tank was removed from Point Loma. It was returned to the plant for rework and for the installation of engines. It is now scheduled to be used in the static engine test program, which begins in October of this year at our Sycamore Canyon engine test area. The second cruiser tank was installed the following day, and in June, a Centaur propellant utilization system was added for evaluation testing. During flight, it regulates the propellant mixture ratio so that both fuel and oxidizer tanks empty at the same time. This ensures consumption of nearly all propellants aboard the vehicle. To accomplish this, it continuously senses the amount of propellants remaining in both tanks. It then varies the speed of the oxidizer boost pump to achieve the proper propellant mixture ratio in the engine. The manometer assembly, which is gold-plated to prevent heat loss, contains a sensing element. An electronic detector computes the desired mixture ratio and generates the correction signals to the boost pump. On the last day of June, the propellant utilization system was being readied for its first test on the cruiser tank. Numerous evaluation programs such as this photo stress study of a weld joint have been conducted in our test laboratory. A major instrument in photo stress is the motion picture camera. Using color film and shooting through a Polaroid filter, it records the strains on the wells for post-test evaluation. The test specimen is coated with a special plastic. Reaction of the plastic to load forces is directly proportional to the reaction of the specimen itself. In this test, a sample of the well joint used on the Centaur tank is subjected to increasing tension until it fails. The joint consists of a butt weld and four rows of spot welds, which hold a reinforcing strip of steel over the seam to strengthen it. To the test engineer, the various colors represent degrees of stress, and the patterns indicate distribution of stress. This joint failed under a load force of 226,000 pounds per square inch, indicating that it was 95% as strong as the parent materials which it joined. Various methods are used to evaluate and investigate parts and components. For example, in the reliability laboratory, X-ray equipment permits inspections of the interiors of steel components. This receiver decoder is part of the Rain Safety Command subsystem, which will destroy Atlas Centaur if that should become necessary. Mounted in the booster vehicle, the unit receives destruct signals from Rain Safety. It then activates explosives in both Atlas and Centaur. It also contains a sensing element which will trigger the explosives automatically if it detects a break in the Atlas Centaur configuration. The destruct capability terminates when Centaur separates from Atlas. During this test, the unit was vibrated at 100 cycles a second, while a high-speed motion picture camera photographing through a fluoroscope observed internal reaction to the shaking. Objective of the test was to determine if special support springs in the canister would prevent vibration from affecting plug-in assembly. Results confirmed the value of the spring. Other tests for Centaur were conducted in an airplane used as a flying laboratory. Highlights of the airborne program will be reviewed by Juan Elizalde, principal engineer on the Centaur Zero Gravity Project. The purpose of the research program is to investigate the effects of zero gravity on propellants and certain vehicle components. The plane used was a C-131B, which was made available to the program through the cooperation of the Air Force's Wright Air Development Division. For one week in April, the plane was based in San Diego and flew a total of 162 zero-g trajectories during 10 missions. To create the zero-gravity condition, this particular aircraft is placed into a shallow dive until it reaches an airspeed of about 250 knots. It is then pulled out of the dive and flown into a parabolic arc. In this maneuver, it can be compared 
to a ballistic trajectory, the gravity-free condition is obtained for as long as 15 seconds. A specially designed canister was used for vent device evaluation and heat transfer experiments. During the initial tests, the canister was suspended in a carriage to prevent it from striking the sides of the plane. The carriage was not used in later tests, since it hampered the movements of the canister in turbulent air, and since it was no longer considered a necessary protective measure. A glass viewer flask containing liquid nitrogen was mounted in the canister. Due in periods of zero gravity, the motion picture camera documented activity in the viewer and recorded the instruments which indicated time, temperatures, pressures and gravity. Several types of venting devices were tested on the viewer. For heat transfer experiments, the wire immersed in liquid nitrogen was heated, causing boiling. By observing the type and rate of boiling during these and subsequent tests, we will be able to calculate more accurately the propellant boil-off rate for center. The study of the behavior of liquids under zero gravity is the primary objective of the airborne program. In one experiment, tension was applied to a water-filled viewer to determine the amount of acceleration needed to settle the liquid. According to present calculations, the force of one hundredth of a G for 30 seconds will be sufficient in space to settle center's propellant to a usable state. This research program is scheduled to continue until August of next year. Future missions will be flown in this modified KC-135, which was assigned to the project in June. It's capable of achieving zero gravity conditions twice as long as the propeller-driven plane, the fact which will enable us to obtain more accurate information on the effects of zero gravity in the months ahead. The engines for Santa are undergoing endurance testing at the West Palm Beach, Florida, Research and Development Center of Pratt & Whitney Aircraft, an associate contractor on the Santa program. Project engineer Dick Mulready reports on the status of engine development. In June 1960, 20 months after we received the Centaur contract, assembly of the first two LR-115 engines for ground tests was completed. Assembly of the third engine was nearing completion at the end of this report period. The third engine will be delivered to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration's Lewis Laboratory, Cleveland, Ohio, for high altitude testing. Current schedules call for the delivery of five additional ground test engines during 1960. The LR-115 engines for the first Centaur flight test vehicle are scheduled for delivery in January 1961. One of the changes which has been made in the course of development of the engines is the revised thrust chamber construction. Previously, the short tubes were positioned in piggyback fashion and gradually interleave between the long tubes. Now the tubes are shaped to allow side-by-side -side positioning with a very short transition area at the inlet manifold. This revised construction allows closer dimensional control and improved quality spray. The heat absorbed by the hydrogen flowing through these tubes provides the power to drive the turbo pump. Hydrogen is such an effective coolant that during firing, Frost remains on the outside of the chamber, although internal temperatures reach 5,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Another design change is the increased length combustion chamber and revised contour nozzle, which provides an improvement in characteristic velocity while maintaining the same envelope dimension as the previous design. In this test, one of the many to which all parts and components are subjected, the thrust chamber is pressurized to test for leaks between the two. One of the keys to the engine's start and restart capability is the electrical spark igniter, which employs hardware similar to the J57 jet engine ignition system. It operates on 24 volts direct current supplied by main vehicle power. 
On signal from the autopilot programmer, this pressurized exciter box supplies the energy to the igniter. The igniter is mounted in the center of the injector and is cooled by hydrogen gas, which flows through the concentric sleeve. Reliability, performance, and overall design integrity of the LR-115 engine are being demonstrated in our static firing program. By the end of June, more than 8,000 seconds of firing time had been accumulated during 130 separate engine tests. In April of this year, nine months after the first complete engine was fired, the major performance and endurance requirements of a preliminary flight rating test were surpassed. An engine was started 20 times in succession and accumulated a total of 41 minutes operation in a series of consecutive firings. By way of comparison, the engine will be required to start three times and fire approximately six minutes during a typical mission. At Cape Canaveral, Florida, construction is continuing on the Space Systems Launch Complex from which Centaur will fly. This scale tabletop model of the complex, designated Pad 36, indicates how it will appear when finished. The service tower, scheduled for completion in October, will stand 170 feet high and is designed to be extended to 200 feet. The launch pad flame deflector is angled to direct flames away from the tower, which will be positioned 350 feet straight back from the pad during launching. The blockhouse is a two-story dome structure located 800 feet from the launch stand. Launch control equipment will occupy the top floor and general service equipment will be located on the bottom. On the model, the cable tunnel, which houses all the instrumentation and control lines running between the blockhouse and the launching pad, has been shortened because of space limitations. By June 30th, the blockhouse was completed and ready for installation of equipment. The walls are constructed of concrete ranging in thickness from 6 to 15 feet. The concrete is covered by 10 feet of sand. Construction is also progressing on schedule on the launch pad, launch and service building, and all other related facilities. According to present schedules, construction of Complex 36 will support erection of the C-1 booster stage in January of 1961. In Sycamore Canyon, a few miles from the Convair Astronautics Plant in San Diego, construction of the Centaur Static Test Stand, S-4, is nearing completion. This facility will support erection of the propulsion test vehicle in mid-October of this year. The service tower is 66 feet high and has retractable work platforms at 8-foot levels up to the 41-foot level. It is mounted over a 52-foot high water-cooled flame deflector. Liquid hydrogen will be stored in a 28,000-gallon tank, which will be shielded from the stand by the ridge of a hill. Liquid oxygen Helium and nitrogen will be supplied from the Atlas fan tank. Test control and instrumentation equipment for S-4 will be located in the same blockhouse which serves the S-1 Atlas test band. As construction progressed on Centaur's test and launch stand, final fabrication was beginning on the first flight vehicle. On June 27th, after first being cleaned thoroughly, the C-1 tank was placed in the Centaur final assembly dock. Here, all electrical, electronic, and mechanical systems, including engines, will be mounted on this first Centaur, which is scheduled for flight in June of next year. 
to describe Centaur as it will appear when it is completed. Here is Kraft Arity, Program Director at Convair Astronautics. You're looking at the Centaur mock-up. A mock-up is a one-to-one -one scale model which has the purpose of locating parts and arranging wiring and piping. The forward end of the tank is shown here and will be covered with insulation by these brackets, so it helps by these brackets here. You see here the five-foot diameter ring on which the payload into the 24-hour orbit will be mounted. An outer ring covers equipment and instrumentation, specifically the vent valve, batteries, telemetry equipment, PU equipment, uh, the guidance platform, and the guidance computer. We are now getting a side view of the forward bulkhead of the Centaur, which of course is also insulated. Now, in a mock-up, we can dispense with a long cylindrical section of the vehicle because there are no particular mock-up problems. You see here a portion of the jettisonable insulation which protects the side walls of the hydrogen tank during ascent through the atmosphere, together with uh, the protuberances here which protect portions of the rear end of the vehicle. We are now looking at the aft end of the center of eagle. You see the two Pratt & Whitney main engines of 15 k thrust each. Hydrogen is fed into these engines from a boost pump which is visible on top of the tank. The hydrogen flows through a pipeline and through a Y which divides the flow towards the two engines. Now these pipelines that you see in an uninsulated form right now, with insulation they later on look like this. The uh, oxygen is being pumped out of the tank through a boost pump which is located between the two engines at the aft end of the oxygen bucket. This particular sphere here and the sphere on the other end contain helium for tank pressurization. This sphere contains hydrogen peroxide for the boost pump. This one contains hydrogen peroxide for the attitude control and the ALIS engine. The aft end of Centaur is pointing towards the sun all the time. Consequently, it is necessary to protect the aft bulkhead of the oxygen tank by means of a reflector shield, which is indicated here. Now, if under the combined effect of the reflector shield and the shadow shielding provided by the engine and other equipment, the temperature in the oxygen tank should fall below a certain critical value, we can open up a certain heat window, which is visible on top of the tank right at the left of the hydrogen boost pump. If this heat window is open, a certain area with high radiation absorptivity is opened up, which now heats up the interior of the oxygen tank. The entire heat control system is pressure controlled from the interior of the oxygen tank. Now let me show you some of the small engines we have on the center of vehicle. You see a set of three attitude control engines. We have a total of six. The same set is on the opposite side of the tank. Uh, these two en engines here are combined pitch and roll control engines. This one is a yaw control engine of three pound thrust. These engines operate on hydrogen peroxide and each one has its own silver screen decomposition device. Now, in addition to those six attitude control engines, we have four Alec engines, of which you see one here. Each one of these engines has 50 pound thrust. The engines also operate on hydrogen peroxide, and each one has its own silver screen decomposition device. The purpose of the Alec engines is to accelerate the vehicle prior to ignition of the main engines in order to make sure that the oxygen and the hydrogen is at the bottom of their respective tanks and can be fed into the main engine. Centaur is carried aloft by the Atlas vehicle. For this purpose, the conical front section of the Atlas is replaced by a cylindrical section to form a sufficiently broad base on which to carry the Centaur vehicle. Atlas and Centaur are connected by a cylindrical adapter. The payload is mounted on top of the Centaur vehicle and is protected during the ascent from aerodynamic heating by a jettisonable nose cone. After the booster phase of the flight, Centaur separates from Atlas and continues to climb under its own power into what we call a parking orbit. At an altitude of 110 nautical miles, it coasts 
about two thirds around the world. When it crosses the equator for the second time, its engines restart and the vehicle goes into a transfer orbit. It coasts in the transfer orbit for approximately 5.3 hours. As it reaches the target orbit, the vehicle, by igniting its engines again, changes its flight plane into the equatorial plane and places the payload into the 24-hour orbit. During the ascent, the Earth rotates underneath the vehicle. By proper timing and arrangement of the ascent orbit, we make sure that when arriving in the 24-hour orbit, we are above the desired spot on Earth. An important mission of Centaur is to place communication satellites into 24-hour orbits, 19,329 nautical miles above the surface of the Earth. In a circular equatorial 24-hour orbit, the velocity is such that a satellite always remains over the same area above the surface of the Earth. As seen from the Earth, the satellite appears to be stationary. A typical mission will place a payload over the equator at 105 degrees west longitude. This is over the Pacific Ocean, approximately 1,000 miles west of Ecuador. Following ground testing, the center of vehicle will be flight tested. When we flight test it, we need a tracking net in order to follow the vehicle in its path around the globe. During the early phases of this test, we will use a tracking net which is presently under development for the manned orbital flights in the Atlas Mercury system. And using this Mercury tracking net, we are departing from Cape Canaveral over the following tracking stations. Bermuda, a mid-Atlantic station south of the Canary Islands, Nigeria, Zanzibar, a mid-Indian Ocean ship, Perth, Australia, and now we are passing over the Australian Missile Range, Woomera. At this point, we plan to restart the engines of Centaur and climb into a 3,000 nautical mile target orbit. As we swing upwards, we will be tracked by a small Pacific island, pass on into the range of the Hawaiian tracking station, and then approach Point Aguello, Old Stone in Arizona. As we reappear over Cape Canaveral, we will restart our engines again and enter the circular orbit at 3,000 nautical miles altitude. When flying into the 24-hour orbit, we plan to use a special Centaur tracking net. In this case, we are launching almost due east from Cape Canaveral and pass over the following stations, Grand Turk and Antigua in the uh, uh, vicinity of the American continent, a ship over the mid-Atlantic Ocean, Ascension Islands, South Africa, a ship in the middle of the Indian Ocean, pass up over a ship between Australia and New Guinea, and then pass over the equator, where we restart under observation from a tracking station at Manus Island. Now, as we gain altitude, we move into the range of Hawaii, Point Aguello, Goldstone, Cape Canaveral. Now, due to the relative motion between Earth and the vehicle, we are following a loop over this area and turn back to the point at which we aim, namely 105 degrees west and the equator. When we arrive at, at that point, we restart our engines and enter the 24-hour orbit under observation from Goldstone and Hawaii. We are presently under direction by NASA to consider for the first three test flights ascent into a 300 nautical mile parking orbit and from there into a 3,000 nautical mile orbit. For these flights, we will be using the Mercury net. The flights will be undertaken according to the present schedule in June, September, and December 1961. During the second flight test series, Centaur will be flown into the 24-hour orbit. In this case, we will be using the Centaur tracking net. The flights are presently scheduled to take place in February, April, and June 1962. Beyond that, firm plans are underway to fly Centaur to Venus and Mars in 1962, and to land softly payloads on the surface of the moon in 1963.